and since Ignacio's <laughs> bomb count has stopped. <laughs> well, uh, everybody, this is um, this is really informal anyway. So this is Paptala. He's a great friend of ours. We met him actually in the in the UN DESA when he was working there, coming from the French FDA. And uh, we've been really impressed of his work, not only for the office of, well, of, I mean, DESA and the director of the ECOSOC, but also in many posts that he has <laughs> uh, joined. And now he's back to Senegal, his home country, and. He's doing a great stuff here in this network of, of, of schools. As he just said, optimizing many things, putting some order, putting some thought of how to drive a great school. So I hand it over to you, Pap. Tell us, how can, be, can we be motivated to work at the UN and then obviously locally and definitely regionally? Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, just... Very quickly, I mean, I know there will be, um, um, you know, time for uh, for Q and A, but just generally speaking, can I have just a thirty second overview of who who we're with, or you know, the the you know the people I'm speaking to? Uh, sure. I so seem to we, understand it's students. So we we started this as a way to follow up on the on the international uh, workshop on advocacy that we organized virtually this year or well, last year in September with young people, young professionals that wanted to be part of the international institutions. So they actually came to our workshop to learn what, what we do, how we do it, and if they were gonna find their way into the UN, the you know, World Bank, the OECD, uh, through learning from our experience, mm -hmm. as you know, We've been working with family issues at the UN for quite a while. And, and we have a style, a specific style to work together with everybody, uh, data oriented, literature review, policy recommendations, expert advice. So that's kind of our way of working. Uh, not mm -hmm. only the system, but also the policies locally, regionally, nationally. So that's kind of the Take away that they might get from you today. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. All right. Amazing. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll I'll say a few words about about myself and my uh, uh, sort of perspective on on those issues, on those questions, and then you know I'm mostly looking forward to to the Q and A. Uh, I don't know if I'm able to speak about myself for 15 minutes. It seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yes, I'll, I'll introduce myself having this in mind, and and um, and also obviously the the. I think it's also interesting. Uh, you know, I'll probably be able to give a few uh, insights on maybe my family situation as well, uh, which is closely linked with uh, the work uh, that I do. Um, and it's actually one of the things that I believe in. I believe in, 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 in looking to basically looking to be whole. Uh, in my opinion, I think that uh, what we're, what's really important for me at least is, is try to be in harmony with myself and try to create harmony between all the different aspects of my life, uh, personal, relational, uh, family, professional, social, everything. Um, and so I, I maybe um, I'll talk about this at some point. Um, so yeah, so a few words about myself and, and, and thinking about uh, the, the work in international affairs as well. Um, you know, I think it takes obviously a certain type of probably of personality to, to, to get into this field, like everything else, right? There are professional skills. But there's always a part of uh, of character and of personality, uh, and um, so for myself, I know that I've I've you know always been somebody who cares. You know, I'm 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 a I'm an emotional person, uh, and so I've always been someone who cared. And uh, I remember, you know, when I was probably not even nine years old, probably between seven and nine was the first time that I. Uh, 
of my own decision, you know, took, took out my, uh, my books and my, uh, and some, you know, some clothes and some things and started uh, giving them away to uh, other kids in the neighborhood who, you know, didn't have the same opportunities that I had uh, growing up. And uh, I also remember when I was 15 was when I started my first sort of social enterprise, uh, so to speak. Um, so there's, there's a phenomenon here in Senegal. There are some kids, a lot of kids who happen to live in the streets that we call Talibé. Talibé. Um, and and um, they, they, so, you know, they live in the street and they, you know, they basically ask for money in the streets. I'll, I'll, I'll make you know, the description very simple. And so I used to have a little basketball court in, in, in my parents' house. And, you know, I love basketball. So uh, one day I decided to create a project that I called Tali Basket. And uh, Tali in Wolof means street. And the Tali Bays are children who live in the street. Uh, and I also used to play street basketball. So it was a play on words with Tali Basket, right? Um, and so I started having those kids and training them in basketball um, and inviting them sometimes at home to play basketball with them and then giving them food um, and then organizing some competitions between those kids and kids in schools so that they would, uh, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, something to, 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 to strike for. And so it was, again, mixing my own passion for basketball, my will to do something, um, so again, I think, you know, I really believe in, 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 in bringing things, uh, together and, and finding your path with what really, uh, motivates you and what you're passionate about. So anyway, long story short, um, the, the, um, after, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough to be, you know, in a bilingual school. So I, you know, I, I graduated from high school, you know, learning, you know, being fluent in English. And, uh, you know, I used to be able to speak Spanish. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can still, I can still read. Puedo uh, leer en español, pero es más difícil hablar. Also maybe sing. But, uh, <laughs> and then, so I, I, I studied in France, actually. So after I graduated from high school, I was really hesitant. I loved the literature. I loved basketball. Uh, and I thought of, uh, you know, one of, I had two principal teachers. One of them was from the US and one was Senegalese. And the one from Senegal wanted me to, you know, go through a very specific system in France. And the other one said that I would strive in American universities. Uh, but then I realized that the reason why I wanted to go and study abroad in the US was because of basketball. And that's the reason why I did not go. <laughs> I ended up thinking, okay, you know what? <laughs> in, I knew enough of myself to know that I would maybe not study a lot. <laughs> and so I decided to do the French system, which we call prépa, which is a very, a very competitive system where basically you have no choice. Um, and I studied, I studied literature and philosophy. So I did, you know, two BAs actually, one in literature and one in philosophy. Uh, and uh, then set the exam for uh, Sciences Po, which is, uh, you know, the Institute of uh, Political Studies. Um, and, you know, it's a national exam, basically, and they pick the 4% best. So it's about 5,000 students who sit the exam each year. And among them, they take, I think, about 200, I think. Um, and I did this because, again, I knew I wanted to create an impact. I wanted to work in development. I knew by that time that I wanted to work in development. I knew that I loved traveling and I loved being exposed to different cultures and different peoples and different languages and everything. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm going to study international relations and try to work in international development. Um, so again, trying to mix my own personal wants and, and, and where I thought I could make an impact. Initially, I wanted to work as a diplomat. And then I realized that diplomacy itself was not for me. We can talk about that uh, later on. I decided I wanted to be an international civil servant and not represent a state, but represent an international organization. So I, you know, set the exam. I studied, uh, you know, international relations. I did a study abroad program at the University of Cambridge where I studied uh, foreign policy and English common law. Don't ask me why. Um, I stopped at one point and I went to the army. Uh, you know, I did basic training and was nominated as lieutenant. 
uh, did some internships, uh, and then uh, came back for my last year of master's degree, um, and started working as I was finishing this. So talking about the professional aspects, um, I started working, you know, I did some internships, I did my own projects, I did some internships also while I was doing my master's. Uh, I was also uh, in the leadership of a few associations, you know, two different university associations, but also another association outside of university uh, that I was working on. It was called Youth Diplomacy. Um, and, uh, you know, also did, you know, a few different internships and then started working at the French Development Agency, uh, which is actually, I don't know where the public is from, but in Spain, the equivalent is called AECID. Uh, which is the Agency for International Development Cooperation. In the US, it's USAID. Um, so I worked there. I started as an intern, um, but I was very curious. I think curiosity is an incredible driver. Uh, I was very curious to learn and, and, and just to learn. Um, so I worked there as an intern. My internship finished, uh, but as an intern, I was already doing a lot. And I remember other interns telling me, dude, you have to ease off, you know, like we're all leaving. Why are you still at the office? You're just an intern. You just paid as an intern. Why do you work so much? Um, well, it turns out not many interns after their internship uh, stay as a consultant, which is what happened to me. And then after that, once my consultancy finished, I was recruited. Uh, there was a brand new position that was created. I was the first one to occupy it uh, in Brussels, uh, the representation office. And then, you know, in the Q&A, maybe I'll get to talk a little more about, you know, what was being done there. I'll just give the broad picture. So then from there, I moved to, I was uh, selected as a JPO, uh, you know, the French uh, program to work at the United Nations. And so I joined the UN headquarters uh, in 2015. I worked there for a couple of years at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs and then at the Secretary General's uh, Crisis Center. And then in 2018, I came to Senegal for a few reasons. One was uh, my desire to do some field work. I had worked in Paris, in Brussels, in New York. I wanted to work, you know, back in, onto the field since I was working in international development. I also got married and, uh, you know, my wife is half Senegalese, half Swiss, um, and, uh, you know, she was living in Brussels, I was in New York, and we thought that, you know, Senegal was the country we had in common, so uh, we decided to come back and settle here. That's why I talk also about the fact that, you know, some decisions are also family-oriented. Um, and also, the network of schools that I work with was created by my own mother, uh, and she created it 25 years ago. Uh, she did an amazing job creating it from scratch and creating a strong reputation in a big school that, uh, you know, has a thousand students. And I thought that it would be a shame to, uh, you know, after this, to just let it go. So I thought, you know, that I wanted to come back and support this work, help it grow, um, you know, help her retire. <laughs> Um, and, and get some entrepreneurial experience. So I joined this network of schools and I've been working with, uh, with her and my brother also joined. So it's, uh, it's also a family venture. Um, and so we're working on developing this network of schools. And uh, I've also been lucky at the same time to, because I'm still interested in international affairs, uh, to work independently as a consultant, as, you know, as you've seen in my bio. Uh, and so right now I'm, uh, working, for example, with uh, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs again on uh, uh, on um, I'm sorry on the Conference of State Parties on the Convention of the on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, and uh, you know I also want to talk about at some point when we talk about working in international relations. Yes, your education is extremely important. Your experience is very important. Uh, your drive and how you work out of those things. But one thing that's also uh, priceless is um, uh, the network. Um, and, and when I say network, I don't want to say it in, in a bad way or in a sort of, you know, you have to manipulate people or manipulate a network. No, what I'm trying to say is that in, in this type of environment, in any professional environment, um, you know, no one does anything by themselves. Um, and 
so you 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 know there's this thing that says that if you want to go far you know if you want to go fast walk by yourself but if you want to go far go with others um and so i really believe in achieving goals together with others and also um you know the people who are around you who know you are also the ones who can uh help you and 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 sort of lead you so for example um you know i was also you know working i did a consultancy project with uh the senegalese firm uh, on a sanitation project with the bill and melinda gates foundation um and you know i can i can say something about that as well it's a it's a very interesting project that i helped set up uh and that i'm still following but for example, the United Nations, the opportunity came to me through, uh, you know, another close friend uh, who was also at the UN um, and who you know very well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so it's also important to, you know, basically the, the, the impressions, I guess, probably that you leave with people is, is also uh, ultimately uh, uh, priceless and, and and you, you won't get enough joy from just the work, you know, the joy also comes from, from the people that you're, that you're with and from, you know, being with, um, with people that you enjoy. So I'll just finish with one last thing uh, and then I can get more into the details of what I do, why I do it or, or any other thing. Um, but just talking about this idea of being whole, you know, there's, um, there's an expert, you know, a guy who studied at Harvard and, and, and who, who used to be, I think he studied engineering at first, and then he realized that he wasn't happy and he switched from computer science, I think, to studying psychology and uh, philosophy. And he designed an, um, an acronym for the different dimensions that you sort of need uh, to have balance in, in order to be really happy. So he said that, you know, you can't really pursue happiness directly, but you can pursue it indirectly through different dimensions. And he created the acronym SPIRE. Um, and so S is, uh, you know, your sort of spiritual well-being. It can be religious or not. You know, it can be, you know, being present in the moment. It can be, you know, something else. Uh, your physical well-being, you know, your nutrition, your sleep, exercise, all those things. Your intellectual well-being. So how, how much you learn, how much you're challenged intellectually. Uh, and then the R is for uh, your relationships. And in my opinion, that's true in your personal life as well as your work relationships. Uh, that's how I interpret it. And then the E is your emotional well-being, your ability to accept and deal with bad emotions and your ability to emulate and to look for good emotions. Um, and so I feel that whether in work, at work, or in life, I think that spire thing is, is, is a great thing to look for. Um, and so I, I've always been sort of, I think the, ultimately the goal is for us to be happy, right? So um, by pursuing what you're really interested in and, 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 and challenging yourself um, and enjoying the process, I think uh, you get to, um, you know, to make the best of, of the path because ultimately it's the path that counts. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, it's already 12.18. I don't want to say any more. Uh, if you want to talk about processes to join the UN, the Gates Foundation, the you know, Senegal, education, uh, schools, whatever it is, uh, I'm open for anything. You, you, you haven't turned your microphone okay, on. Okay, thank you, Pablo. It was like <laughs> impressive. I, I didn't know some of, some of the things that you said. I have to say that when you mention network, it's true. We cannot go along. And, and it reminds me of our, your usual tradition of going down to the shore around these dates, the end of Ramadan. So it was great, great memories that from that time that we're all in this network and, and definitely friendship together. And I will just open the floor for some questions. <laughs> So I, I see some questions here. Let me see. Um, so here's one that, how competitive the education in Africa is and how can we improve it from the family perspective? Hmm. Uh, how competitive? There are different ways of describing the level of competitiveness. Um, 
it is it is competitive, but not for the reasons that one might think. Um, it is competitive and not competitive. Uh, there are, luckily enough, so I, I can't talk about Africa as a whole. Um, I'd rather talk about Senegal, which I know a little better. Um, in Senegal, we're lucky enough to have a lot of schools, whether uh, public or private. Um, also, it depends on whether we talk about, you know, elementary, primary school, or, uh, you, know, high, you know, elementary through high school or university. Um, but Senegal is a country that's lucky enough to have uh, a great number of schools, and usually there are there is access to any level of schooling, any level of education, no matter what your uh, social status is. I would say, um, because just like everywhere, there are different types of you know of schools, and and um, that's unfortunately a factor. That's that's a reality uh, in every society. Um, there there are also a lot of great uh, schools and universities abroad, um, you know, in Burkina, in Rwanda, uh, in South Africa, you know, in, in, in Morocco, all those things. Now, the university, the public system is uh, very challenged by the fact that, um, you know, they, they, there's already a lot of investments. I believe up to 40% sometimes of the national budget can go into education, but there's a difficulty in, in absorbing the the mass because as you know we have a very young population um, and so the infrastructure whether it's for uh, you know education in terms of school or other types of education right whether it's uh, sports for example uh, there's a little at, 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 you know at higher levels right university level becomes a bit harder to uh, provide uh, for the needs of everyone. And so the private sector also plays a big role. Um, but the challenge, the competitiveness comes from this, from the fact that it's hard, there aren't that many um, public universities compared to the demand. And so, you know, in Senegal, in Dakar, for example, in a capital city, for example, it becomes hard to, to keep up. You know, the students really compete for uh, you know, the room, not the room in terms of the physical space, but the conditions are, are a little hard. And so sometimes it, it makes it more competitive because it asks a little more of you, uh, right? When the numbers are high, uh, when there are so many students, um, then of course that means that the competition becomes, uh, becomes greater, right? Um, so obviously there's a need for uh, increasing, you know, the, the, the public education offer, uh, but also the private sector is really investing more and more into, into schools. Education is becoming sexier and sexier, so to speak, uh, for, for individuals, for companies, and for, uh, for private investors as well. And we're also seeing more and more, you know, training centers that are specifically dedicated to, you know, certain issues. Uh, there's also been a discovery of uh, oil and gas uh, not too long ago, so there's also been an increase in, in, in the number of trainees related to that sector. Uh, obviously, you know, as a country, what you want is to know what the needs of your, you know, of your private companies are. You need to know what your development trajectory is, right? Let's say you're a country and you say, you know, you want to develop your country, you know, by investing heavily in textile, for example, you know, or investing in finance or investing in telecoms or whatever. Once you have your sort of development trajectory, you know what you want to have as a driver of your economy, you know, where you want to be in 20 years. Therefore, you know what sort of uh, trainings you need to provide the people with right now so that in 5, 10, 15 years, they're able to, you know, uh, work in, in, the, in the economic sectors that you've identified as your driver. Uh, I'm sorry, I went on a little tangent here. Uh, I hope that answers a little bit the question. <laughs> so I have another question related to education, that how might a higher education degree matter in the post-COVID era? And the next one, is it's more related to the, your description of the, at the beginning of pursuit of happiness. Is closely mm -hmm. related to the martial hierarchy of needs. 
So whatever you want to answer mm -hmm. first uh, to close the topics. And <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of, uh, it's very interesting because uh, right now, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of experts were already seeing that um, an education degree, the degree itself was becoming less and less important. And that thought has been made clearer with uh, the COVID crisis and all the online trainings. Uh, we're, we're focusing more and more on the skills, right, the specific skills. Um, and so one thing also that we have here, for example, you know, when you talk about the needs of the economy, um, you know, you can have a BA in literature, you can have a BA in whatever topic. Ultimately, what matters is uh, the skills that you have, right? Uh, we're also in an information society where the knowledge itself is more and more accessible, right? Anything you want to know, you can know in the matter of seconds. Uh, and so what's becoming more and more important is how to look for that, how to organize that, uh, you know, the specific skills rather, so the know-how more than the, the actual knowledge. I'm not saying that, you know, knowledge is, is, is underrated, of course, is overrated, of course, no. Um, and in the Spire thing, uh, the I stands for this. But uh, I do believe that Obviously, you know, uh, online trainings are going to become more and more the norm. Uh, and not just for students, but also for professionals. We're seeing more and more professionals that are switching careers just or kids. even in their own career, they, they see the responsibilities evolve. They have to do more and more things by themselves, right? We used to be in a world where it was very specialized and you had specific people That's dedicated hard. to specific tasks. But more and more you're seeing, you know, one person, you know, everyone has to do a little bit of everything. Uh, the tools make everything more available. If you want to create a website, if you want to create a presentation, if you want to, you know, anything you want to do, you know, it's accessible. So now it's going to be more and more in the, you know, education world as well as in the professional world about the mix of skills that you can bring together uh, in order to really answer uh, the, the, you know, the needs of, of your job or of your company in an original manner. Uh, actually, you mentioned the role of the private sector in the skill building there, at least in mm -hmm. the example that you gave of Africa. And also your trajectory, I mean, your career has shown that it's more about skills. I mean, start with literature. I started with humanities and social studies as well. So it's like, right. we ended up here in the international <laughs> relations. What would you say, just kind of to finish, uh, like, I don't know, two or three skills that you see Oh, these are really important for the international arena. Oh, I love this. Um, oh, for the specifically for the international arena. Well, yeah, I mean now, I mean you have moved from the locally, internationally, locally again. Now you're also working for international organizations again. Yeah. Why would you say yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. The, the skill that you uh, you would recommend us to develop better? Number one. Number one, no matter how, why, where, when, I would say adaptability, right? Uh, and how do you develop adaptability? I think curiosity plays a big role. I think being able, maybe that's also because of my personal path, right? Having worked in the private sector, the public sector, national, international, um, you know, being able to adapt to uh, something new. And to be able to adapt to something new, one of the great things is to be able to observe and learn, right? So coming into a very new situation, you know, let's say, okay, I'm starting up, you know, I'm starting at the UN, okay, I'm looking at what's being done, I'm being very curious, I'm trying to understand who does what, where, when, how, you know, just take everything in. And then ultimately you get to be able to put things in boxes and you start to figure out how you can move around in this um, environment. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to get a job sometimes in, in international organizations just because the level of competitiveness is, is very high. Uh, so being able to have this flexibility um, is also an asset, right? Because then you're more flexible in terms of the approach that you take in. You know, maybe you're a JPO, maybe you're a volunteer, you know, maybe you start in an NGO and then you go into an international organization or maybe you start in a government and then you go into an international organization or the other way around, right? Or, so, so being flexible um, and being a quick learner, uh, or let's say an avid learner, I would say is the, 
is the number one uh, skill. I see it's already 1230. I don't want to go overboard. Um, Just one. Uh, okay. well, yeah, thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> thank you so much, Bob. I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's definitely one of the skills is to <laughs> adjust to the time. Yeah. But also, I mean, since this is going to be posted on our website, as you've seen from other uh, sessions, everybody can share it and everybody can see it in, in their own time zone. For me, it's 8, mm -hmm. 8 a.m. I guess for you, it's definitely later. But yeah. thank you so much for your insights. I know that you been going f back and forth and i hope that you are coming to new york soon i mean i've been getting that question from everybody <laughs> when is Bob coming back so i don't know if they <laughs> so we'll see depends on the situation <laughs> exactly i don't know totally so anyway Bob, thank you so much for thank for you your time thank you it's, it's, it's been a pleasure thanks for the opportunity to um uh, you know sharing and you know sharing my sharing my piece uh Actually, you talk about you talk about New York and moving to New York. That also touches on the point of adaptability, right? Because you also have to, when you work in international affairs, obviously you adapt to new countries. Uh, you move around a lot, and every time it's a new way of behaving, right? So again, coming back to this point, but thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity to share this with uh, with everyone. And uh, you know, of course, I'm open to to you know if anyone wants to have more discussion privately or anything. I don't. I don't know how these things go usually, but I'm, I'm open for anything. Thank you so much, Bob. <laughs> and I uh, hope to Thanks. see you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.